Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's time for another batch of Deep Space updates, beginning, as always, with the launches from the last couple of weeks. So on the 20th of October, there was a Falcon 9 launching from Vandenberg, carrying a batch of Starlink Group 4-31, and this launched exactly at sunset. And that meant it was pretty visible. For me, uh, I was slightly further west, so the sun was still slightly higher up, but I saw a very easily visible trail extending up into the sky, and I could track the second stage. But uh, people in Southern California, the skies were starting to get dark, and it was very easy to see the second stage. It was launching into like the usual 55 something degree orbit, so after dropping the second stage, it actually made a dogleg turn to the east. Uh, people in Arizona had a very easy view of it as well. On the 29th, there was a Long March 2D launch from Jiquan. Uh, it was a Xi'an 20C satellite, which again, experimental, highly classified. We're not even sure of the inclination that this thing ended up in, and I'm sure I could find it at this point, but we're not sure much about, we don't know much about that. 31st, there was also a Long March 5B. It was the big one, right? This was the one carrying the Mengtian module for the Chinese space station. That module, of course, went to the space station. It's docked and it has already been transferred around to its final position, making the sort of T shape of the space. Actually, from some angles, it now looks like a TIE fighter because it's got these big solar panels coming out. Anyway, of course, given that it's a Long March 5B, that upper stage was left in orbit to spiral around the Earth for a few days before finally deorbiting and possibly breaking up over the Pacific. Thankfully, it, it looks like it didn't hit anything. It doesn't look like any debris made it to land, but there was more than one uh, re-entry notice from uh, Space Force. Whatever. I wish they would fix this going forward, but we now have... Uh, they shouldn't be launching another one of these with space station parts. Instead, they'll be doing other stuff with it. On the 1st of November, we had the spectacular Falcon Heavy. That's right, we haven't had a Falcon Heavy launch for a few years, and they're getting back. They finally get some missions lined up for it. This was USSF-44. It was our first Department of Defense, you know, national security mission, carrying a whole bunch of test satellites, I believe, up into geostationary orbit. And while this was obviously cool to see the world's biggest currently operational rocket flying, I really in particular loved the fact that uh, from the returning boosters, they managed to stagger them far enough apart that you could see one booster from the other as they were descending and you could watch the other one light its, its engines before landing. Uh, unlike other Falcon Heavy flights, this one intentionally expanded the core, so they returned the boosters to the launch site and the core went and continued out and you know, burned up in the atmosphere far out over the Atlantic. And honestly, that's what you really need to do with a Falcon Heavy to really maximize its usage. Right, trying to recover that core is, is hard and it doesn't really give you that much of an extra advantage over a regular Falcon 9. Moving onwards, on the 2nd of November, there was a Soyuz 2.1B with a frigate, um, you know, a ferry stage on top launching from Blasetsk. This is carrying an E6, uh, EKS-6, basically it's a missile early warning satellite that sits in a Molnia orbit. There's, uh, I think there's six of these actually, and they're set up in such a way that there's always one up high over Russia that it's able to look for potential, you know, launches uh, and whatever. 3rd of November, we had another Falcon 9 carrying the Hotbird spacecraft, Hotbird 13G. If you remember, we had 13F last month. Uh, this is for EUTELSAT and it was launching to geostationary uh, Earth orbit. 4th of November, there, we got Electron. Yes, an Electron, the launch was called Catch Me If You Can because they were going to try a, a catch under the rocket. It was the reusable version. So this was carrying a, a satellite called MATS, the Mesospheric Air Glow or slash Aerosol Tomography and Spectroscopy spacecraft. That is a Swedish satellite designed for studying waves in Earth's atmosphere, right? This is gravity waves, not gravitational waves. This is where the atmosphere can bounce up and down like waves on the surface of the ocean. And uh, like a great example recently was, of course, the Tonga eruption towards the start of the year. So anyway, yeah, the booster went up, deployed the second stage, that made it to orbit just fine. The second, or the first stage, 
comes back down through the atmosphere. The helicopter is out there waiting and we're all watching. And apparently they lost telemetry and since they weren't sure where it was, the helicopter was ordered to fly away just in case it came down in the wrong place. So it had a wet splashdown, but it has been recovered as far as I can tell. 5th of November, Long March 3B slash E, the ChinaSat-19, which is a, geosta a geosynchronous communication satellite again. This is actually a replacement for ChinaSat-18, which launched and failed very soon afterwards. Also on the 5th of November was uh, Iran launched a three-stage solid rocket you know, vehicle, which they say would be able to put uh, 80 kilograms into a 200 kilometer orbit. This is a new rocket called the Kayem um, 100. However, it doesn't sound like this was supposed to go to orbit. It sounds like this was more like a first stage test. It's really not clear. There's you know, very limited information, of course, but it looks like this doesn't wasn't going to orbit. It was never planned to go there, but it may go there at some point in the future. Anyway, the 7th of November, we had an Antares and it was a spectacular launch. Again, launching during the early morning, uh, just before sunrise, easily visible up the East Coast. So this was carrying a Cygnus spacecraft named Sally Ride. It's the penultimate launch of the, of the Antares 230 Plus, which has the Russian engines on it. There's enough engines for one more launch. After that, they have to get the Firefly engine, the Reaver engine version, or uh, they'll have to put Cygnus on a Falcon 9, I believe, because the other alternative would be putting on top of uh, an Atlas V, and there's no Atlas V's available. So there's a couple of odd things went on with this launch. First of all, there was some weird attitudes during, like after stage separation, where the at one point it looked like the second stage was pointing upwards in a way, like 90 degrees to the angle it should be when it lit its engine and then turned back in the right direction. Now that might be intentional or it might be a problem. It might be intentional because the Cygnus has, or sorry, the, Atla, uh, the Antares second stage is a solid rocket motor and you can't control the amount of delta V. So to steer this thing into the correct orbit, you have to use off axis steering, which is where you fire at an angle away from where it should actually be so that you get less delta V from that from that moment. Uh, so that might be intentional or it might be wrong, but it did make it into the correct orbit. So I think I'm, I'm sort of leaning towards the intentional. One thing that was de definitely not intentional was the fact that they had uh, two solar panels and only one of them deployed. Now these are the sort of circular solar panel designs similar to those that we saw on Lucy. I'm not sure how closely related they are, but it, you know, we do know that there's a problem with one of the panels on Lucy that didn't deploy 100%. Regardless, the spacecraft had enough power to make it all the way to the space station and be berthed. I don't know if they'll do like some inspection on those panels, perhaps with the robot arm, with you know the canid arm, because everyone wants me to say that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, on the 10th of November, we had a launch. Uh, the, we had the final Atlas V launching from Vandenberg, and I was really wanting to get to it, but yeah, it just was going to be too hard. So yeah, uh, JPSS was the main payload. That's the Joint uh, Polar Satellite System. That's basically a you know Earth monitor that's launching and operating with NOAA. But the more interesting and you know, cool secondary payload was something called Lofted, right? The Low Orbit Flight Test Inflatable Decelerator. This is the largest blunt body heat shield that has ever been flown and tested. So this is an inflatable heat shield, which after uh, you know deployment, it expanded out, it decelerated, re-entered over Hawaii, and it has been recovered from the Pacific. It looks like it's in pretty good shape and I cannot wait to see some footage from this. This is obviously a really useful technology because for example, spacecraft going to Mars, they would can really benefit from a much larger heat shield because the density of the Martian atmosphere is so low, but there's other options as well. Uh, elsewhere in talking about uh, you know, space events, Tianzhou 4 has just undocked from the Chinese space station. That'll be headed home. And there's another cargo spacecraft, Tianzhou 5, getting ready to launch. So these are the cargo spacecraft the Chinese space station uses. SLS. 
It rolled out to the launch site last week in preparation for a launch next week. And just like, yeah, I don't know, their luck seems to be terrible, but a Hurricane Nicole came through and they decided not to roll it back and Nicole pretty much rolled very close to Kennedy Space Center. The concern was that the SLS is rated for wind gusts of 85 miles per hour. And some of the sensors that people were reading were saying 100 miles per hour gust. But according to NASA's spokesperson, the most they recorded at the SLS site was 82 miles per hour. And they are going to have to do a bunch of inspections and make sure that everything is working. But during the whole uh, wet, bad weather situation, uh, all the maintenance procedures continued, you know, all the purges and stuff to keep it primed and pressurized. So they're going to do an inspection and then it's pretty likely they'll try to launch it next week. Um, Astra, Astra came up with their, you know, third quarter earnings and yeah, they're still not making money. They have a lot more orders for their, uh, like, electric space engine, which is going to be used by satellites. They're laying off 16% of their staff, but they did show a really cool video about their space launch system too. Um, so this is what's going to replace their very small rocket, which hasn't been hugely successful, like two successful launches out of 10 flights, not great numbers. Um, yeah, the video shows like a test stand, which I noticed, by the way, is at Atwater, which is one of the, it's next to Castle Airfield in uh, you know, Merced, which is a place I've flown into. So next time I fly there, I'm going to have to look for this engine test cell down there. They also talked about the second stage engine, which we don't know. We know the first stage engines are almost certainly Firefly Reaver engines, based on the numbers that we've heard and the fact that we heard from other sources that there was a deal. The upper stage engine is going to be £6,500. I don't think they're building it internally. It could be a match to Ursa Major, who have a uh, Hadley engine, which is a small one. That's an option, but we're not really sure what's going on just yet. Okay, over at JPL, the Psyche mission is going to move forward. If you remember, it was getting ready for launch on a Falcon Heavy this year, and then it was cancelled about a month beforehand. There has been a fairly large and damning report from NASA's uh, investigative people basically saying that JPL didn't have enough people, enough skilled people. It was not, it was dismissing problems because they just didn't have the people to look at them. Yeah, they were, they were not happy with this, but Psyche is going to continue. However, the Veritas mission is being suspended for at least three years until all the other stuff gets out of the way. Now, JPL are handling a lot of stuff. One of the big things they're, of course, looking at is the Mars sample return. And that is almost more important because there's a timer on that, right? There's many other moving parts and other countries that will be involved in that. So they can't really, you know, they have to reduce the load on JPL by the sound of things. That's what NASA seemed to be saying. And, and by the way, yes, also I've got to remember, tonight apparently they're having a premiere for a movie called Goodnight Oppie. And this features a lot of people from JPL, many people I know, and they, you know, it's great to see Doug and friends on screen. This is a big screen, big budget documentary about the Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity. And I've watched this on a screener and it is amazingly high quality. This is like, it's, it's Amblin Entertainment, which is Spielberg's company. It's got a VFX work by Industrial Light and Magic, and it just has all these great stories from the Mars Exploration Rover program. And of course, you know, really tugs on the heartstrings towards the end, right? Uh, yeah, uh, it's going to be coming to Amazon later in the, uh, I think in December. And I have an interview with the director coming really soon. I, I really like the movie. I'm, I'm so glad that somebody decided to make something of this quality for this story. Coming back to the jet look, other space news. Bob Behnken today announced that he is retiring from NASA. He's been there for 22 years. And I guess it's worth mentioning his retirement because he was one of the first people to test fly a dragon. He flew to the space station on DM2. 
Uh, meanwhile, over on Boeing's side, it looks like Starliner's first flight has been delayed further until April of 2023, which means now that SpaceX will fly all six of their basic Dragon crew flights before Boeing even completes the testing of Starliner. That is unfortunate, but uh, yeah, clearly they have work still to do. The FCC uh, chairperson announced that uh, they're going to spin off a new bureau for space activities, which is, you know, basically a way of reorganizing around the fact that they're having a lot more work coming in from space sources. One statistic that was mentioned is they have pending, uh, or they have like under consideration or whatever, applications for a total of 64 thousand satellites. This is obviously between multiple constellations. The FCC is trying to figure out which ones and what which they should license and just how, you know, what restrictions and everything. So anyway, um, space definitely getting promoted a bit at, on, at the FCC. China, they still have their space plane in orbit. If you remember, it launched a, a couple of months ago. It raised its orbit recently and then it deployed something and we're not sure what it deployed. When we saw it deploy, there was a lot of people thought, oh, it's going to come home because that's what happened last time. It dropped a service module and then landed. But the landing window has came and gone and it is still in orbit. Right now, the the windows, so the windows come around every like three days when the, the you know runway lines up with the orbit. But for the next you know three weeks or so until we get into December, this will always be at night. So that may not be the time they want to land their autonomous space plane back on Earth. So it could be December but at the earliest before we see it land. Honestly, I don't know. They don't tell us anything. Uh, NASA, on the other hand, told us all about Starship, right? All sorts of details on what their the current status is. So uh, Raptor production has apparently reached a cadence of one engine per day, which is pretty good in terms of you having to fill out a, an entire Starship um, super heavy booster. They have a plan for like tr for getting the first orbital flight test. You know, they know the various steps they need to do. Today, or a couple of days ago, they took Starship 24 off of the top of the booster and uh, the booster did a spin prime test today. We thought it might have a static fire, but it didn't get that far. So yeah, according to NASA's document, we expect that they could potentially fly as early as December. So I'm going to say February, just to make sure. Before then, they're going to have to you know, finish doing the booster test fire. They're going to have to put the Starship back on top. Then they're going to have to go through a full wet dress rehearsal and get the FAA licensing sorted out. And then, yes, then it can make its big flight. We don't expect them to recover the booster uh, on this first attempt. We do expect uh, them to attempt to at least look capture the, the Super Heavy, or not Super, yeah, the Starship and you'll get all that sweet, sweet data off it and hopefully it will survive the re-entry. The other sort of news from space in the last couple of weeks was, of course, it's eclipse season. We had an amazing solar eclipse if you were in the right place. And that was also the day I did my first night flight. So I, I flew on the darkest possible night of the year. <laughs> and, and then, uh, and yeah, we had a lunar eclipse a couple of nights ago, which of course meant that it was cloudy here and I didn't see anything. But there's been some great photos from all over, including uh, some nice photos of SLS sitting on the pad next to the full moon, obviously, or sorry, next to the eclipsed moon, obviously a few days before the hurricane come through and uh, with all its clouds and everything. So that's the news for the week, a couple of weeks actually. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you guys around. I'm Scott Banley. Fly safe. Oh,